Well, hey, all you wiretappers, back here again. And we're now into episode four, I think, or three. I don't know. Anyhow, we're in the middle of telling the Jimmy Chagra story. It's a multi-part series, as you all know, if you paid any attention to the show notes. And I'll have these there in order. Jimmy Chagra, the legendary, legendary by now, especially after the Folly Cove operation that we heard about last week from a participant in that operation. He's now the legendary marijuana smuggler in that subculture, in that world. You know, it was enormous. And he did that in Boston, in the Massachusetts area. I think about that. You go way down into either Columbia or Mexico and load a freighter and then go way out to the ocean, the Atlantic Ocean, come back in and up by Boston and unloaded in Massachusetts. And if you're in Massachusetts, you probably ought to have the approval of Raymond Patriarch. And I couldn't find anything that showed that. I've read where he did have the approval of Patriarch and did have some business with him up there. I'm not sure. Maybe Bobby Luisi would know about that. But after this operation where they, as you got the inside story of it, if you didn't go back to the Folly Cove operation in the episode just before this, with Kim Swidell or Kermit Swidell. He has the book, Folly Cove. Anyhow, he's spending money as fast as he can. I mean, this guy, I've seen these guys, they get a score and man, they, you can always tell a dope dealers, he started to get them made, one of these kind of small time, more suburban or kind of quasi suburban dope dealers. They move to the suburbs and they have an above ground pool and they buy a new kind of not the highest end car in the world, but a new, more expensive car. And the clothing kind of amps up and you can just tell the jewelry amps up it's more ostentatious, shall we say. So you kind of tell as they were getting going, if that they were making a little money off of uh, selling drugs and their drug smuggling operation. His brother, Lee Chagra, down in El Paso, is becoming the most famous drug lawyer in the entire Southwest and some in the, across the South. The government, as usual, in law enforcement, we always think of as a mob lawyer or a professional career criminal lawyer. He must be part of it. And they always thought that Lee was the brains behind the Chagra organization. But, you know, I, I don't really see that he was. He did like to spend money and he probably cut a corner or two. And he probably advised him about what a lawyer can do, advised him about possible pitfalls and what he was doing, how to cover himself. But these guys also, the two of them in Las Vegas, they're the two most infamous and flamboyant gamblers in Las Vegas. I mean, this seems to run in this family. The youngest brother, Joe, I couldn't find out much about his gambling habits. But these two were famous in Las Vegas. And when you get to the pinnacle of success in the criminal underworld, there's kind of no place to go but down, especially for the criminal. And when you get big and flamboyant, the cops and the feds take notice. I know we start seeing somebody that start getting more things and cars. We think, hmm, I'd like to have that classic, totally restored 1949 Chevrolet pickup in our fleet out here. Of course, we never got to keep a car like that. It wasn't any good. And, you know, you couldn't use it but once. And people would say, oh, yeah, the cops are driving that car. But you see the stuff that they've got and you see that they've got a lot of things and they've got a lot of money. And you get informants talking about them, how they're getting big, and you go after them. And boy, once the federal government trains their sights on somebody, on in this case, on Jimmy Chagra, he was doomed. He was doomed to spend a lot of time in jail. It would just be a matter of time. I remember following some guys with the feds, and I'm thinking, if these guys only knew what was getting ready to come down on them and how many assets were put together and arrayed and put in place and people and all that. And they'd say, you know, hey, give me a job at the Ford plant, but they don't. They like to play the game. And Jimmy saw the money now was in cocaine because by now the cocaine is becoming mainstream big time. It's not just for a few rich kids and trust fund babies and things like that. This Cocaine is just going crazy and crack cocaine comes along during this time, these years, and it, there was even more demand for it. So by the fall of 1976, we're going to start seeing the beginning of the end for Jimmy Chagra. Jimmy made friends with a couple of Las Vegas based private pilots that many times they'd flown him back and forth from El Paso to Vegas when he'd go up to gamble and his brother too, Lee. And there was two pilots that he 
befriended Jerry Wilson and Dick Joyce, and he then recruited them to start flying in loads. And kind of interesting little sidelight, this Dick Wilson will go on to invent and market and sell and become fabulously wealthy, not with cocaine, but he invented the solo flex. I tell you what, it's <laughs> that's a story in itself. I may try to do a bonus episode just on his inventing the solo flex and what happened after that and how that all played out. Jimmy was got these guys to fly loads and loads of Colombian weed from the Cayman Islands. They had both been private pilots in Las Vegas, like I said, and Jimmy had used them and he trusted them. And by the end of 1976, Jerry Wilson, the guy that invented the solo flex, was flying a DC-4. A DC-4 is a pretty good size airplane. And this Dick Joyce was flying a Cessna 310, a little smaller airplane. DEA found out about them, and they put trackers on planes used by these guys, but they never got to a couple of them, the ones they mainly used. I think these guys, anytime you get into these criminals, they like to throw out smoke screens. Maybe they got two planes that are about alike and they kind of make it obvious what one is and less obvious what the one they really use is. But the DEA was big into putting trackers on these planes back then. Tell you a lot. Just throw a tracker on there and all of a sudden you see us going down to Mexico or Colombia or the Caribbean and coming back up to the Midwest. (laughs) They can tell you a lot right there. That's pretty good intelligence. They found out, the DEA found out that Chagra was expecting shipment of high-grade Colombian weed from Colombia, or where else would it come from, and it was going to go to a rural area around Ardmore, Oklahoma. That's another thing these guys started doing was landing back up in Arkansas and Oklahoma, kind of far enough away from the border that customs, if you got by the border, nobody paid much attention to you in a small plane. It's kind of a middle-sized town, about halfway between Oak City and Dallas-Fort Worth that are along I-35, if you've ever done that trip, I-35 south through Oklahoma and into Dallas-Fort Worth. Now, on December 30th, 1976, Dick Joyce landed his Cessna 310 in New Orleans, told Customs he was just coming in from the Cayman Islands, was headed to Oak City. They searched the plane, they didn't find anything on it, but they alerted the DEA and DEA were like, they knew something was up with Tiger and with Dick Joyce and his other buddy, Wilson. And so they started tracking that plane there through with forward air controllers, the air controllers on the radar, and they didn't have a tracker on it. They're tracking the radar, and they, so I was headed north as he should up through Texas. About the same time, another air traffic controller had a request from a DC-4 to land somewhere in Texas to refuel. DC-4, again, like I said, it's a huge plane. It's got four propeller-driven engines, like something you go overseas on a trip. He claimed, and this is a good one, he claimed he was carrying radioactive waste. So nobody wants to get too close to it. And the DC-4 then was given permission. He landed and refueled and took off again before anyone really could get to where he was. Now the Fort Worth air controllers, they see blips for two planes traveling parallel, heading north. They don't really realize they're connected. One's a DC-4 and the other one is Dick Joyce and his Cessna 310. Now, what they were doing is the plane with a known destination, the 310, is going to Oak City. It would like fly real close to each other, maybe even get on top of each other. And then as they pass over where the drugs are going, the plane with the drugs will drop down quickly and the other plane will keep on going on his pre-planned route. Well, it's New Year's Eve. Another thing, pretty smart, do it on New Year's Eve because it's hard to get guys to work on holidays and New Year's Eve and sometimes even at night. I've seen that. People get away with a lot of stuff in these big cities because you're like white collar crime people, your intelligence guys, a lot of them don't really want to work at night. It's hard to get them to work at night and weekends too. And you'd have to be an idiot not to know that. And I know they knew it, but when I was doing, I wasn't going to volunteer to go out there by myself at night and the sergeants would never make you. It is what it is. As I used to always say, they get to Ardmore, DC four drops out, but he's lost one engine. And for some reason, I think his buddy, Dick Joyce in the Cessna, was worried about him. So he landed at this little airport in outside of Ardmore and sewed the DC-4. Then when that happened, 
they were on that. And when he made that stop and he didn't go on to Oak City where we were supposed to go, they headed that way. They were like flying that way. And the U-Haul trucks and drivers were already there. By the time the agents got there, you only move so fast. By the time the agents got there, guys that took the marijuana off the plane they had four U-Haul trucks, these like pretty good sized trucks. They'd filled them up and they were taken off and the cops started trying to stop these guys and they got most of them stopped. They caught both the pilots and a couple other guys that were involved in rental cars driving away from the scene. Altogether, they took in 10 guys, recovered 17,000 pounds of pot in 270 some burlap bags. I'll tell you what, it was a big deal. The searches were kind of shaky and they really had a hard time. Once the pilots got away from the planes, they were just like in the area driving away. They happened to be pilots. I kind of had a hard time later on in court linking the pilots up to the plane and Jimmy Chagra wasn't there. So Lee Chagra then has handed this case and he coordinates the legal defense. If you remember our friend Kim Swidell last week talked about what a sweet deal that Lee Chagra got everybody. And because this guy, the Black Prince, as they called him, he is nobody's fool. This guy is one hell of a defense lawyer. If he'd have gone start doing the mob in big cities, he would have gotten a lot more press and a lot more publicity and more people would have heard of him. Of course, they're going to end up hearing of him anyhow for other reasons. Before the trial of the El Paso 10, Something else happened in Columbia that was a difficult situation for Chagra. Now, the Columbians had fronted that load that they lost at Ardmore, Oklahoma. And Jimmy had to make it good. The Columbian suppliers, a guy named Lionel Gomez, he operated out of Santa Marta, Columbia, which is a small city on the northeast corner of Columbia, or northeast coast of Columbia, the closest you can get to the Cayman Islands. So that's where they were picking it up down there. I mean, the Clemens were getting it there and then taking it over to the Caymans. But in this case, they went clear to Columbia. Jimmy sent one of the Ardmore defendants, Jerry Wilson, to Columbia rather than to the Caymans to get this other load. He needed to get that and sell it so he can pay for that first, the lost load, and pay for this one, too. It's probably going to be kind of a wash as far as money was to be made on it, but he's got to keep those Columbians happy. Well, this plane, they overloaded it, and it crashed on takeoff. Now, Wilson's injured, and he's in a hospital. His co-pilot was injured even worse, said he had burns over 70% of his body, and he was in the hospital, too. Wilson gets out pretty quick and gets a hold of Jimmy, and Jimmy's going to fly down there to try to straighten everything out. I mean, this guy had guts, I'll say that. The load, before the Columbian authorities can get it all together, the load disappeared. So they're not going to owe for this load. They still owe for the first load. But they did take the other pilot, Jerry Wilson, and the guy who was injured and in the hospital into custody. Jimmy was waiting up in the United States for the load. So finds out what happened. He flies into action. First thing he does, he telephones the owner of a private airline service out of Las Vegas, chartered his plane. And he gave him kind of a cover story so he would be willing to do it. And what he said was that Jerry Wilson, who was well known to this other charter service that out of Vegas that he chartered or hired, they knew Jerry Wilson said it would be more amenable to helping. He said he got injured in a car wreck down in Columbia, South America, and uh, hospitals and everything aren't that good. Let's go down and get him, bring him back to the United States. So the guy says, okay, he sends his pilot to El Paso and... He has to pick up Jimmy's passport on the way because he was waiting over in Atlanta, actually, for the dope to come in from Columbia. Brings, gets his passport and goes to Atlanta and picks him up. And then they go to Miami where they pick up a couple of paramedics and medicine to for burns in particular. As kind of a side, I mentioned this before, uh, I guess Jerry Wilson, he had worked for this charter service that we're using now. And he had said when he was leaving and started flying dope for Jimmy Chagra that he said he was going into business with Lee Chagra to promote his new exercise machine, the Solo Flex. And he will, as I said, will go on to success with Solo Flex. Now, when Jimmy and the two paramedics arrive in Santa Marta, the stories changed for the pilots and for the paramedics. They didn't know what they were getting into either. 
Jimmy just left him at the airport and then leaves and comes back and an ambulance shows up at the airport. Paramedics will find a horribly burned guy inside and treated him as best they could. Then they learned this wasn't Jerry Wilson who they thought they were going to treat. Jerry Wilson was kind of waiting in the background in jail. They had him held in jail and Jimmy goes to the jail to try to get him out. They're going to bribe the jailers and the local police, whoever's got him to get him out, you know. But that's pretty easily done many times in a place like Columbia. When you got money like Jimmy Chagrit, you're going to have enough cash money to get somebody out of jail unless there's way too much heat. When Jimmy went back to the jail to try to bribe the guards to get Jerry Wilson out, the ambulance had returned to the hospital, and Jimmy was also there trying to bribe somebody to get more painkillers. But the Colombian authorities were starting to put all this together. They ended up taking Jimmy, the charter, the new charter pilot, two paramedics in the custody. And so they've already got the burnt pilot, and they got Jerry Wilson in custody. So they got everybody in custody. They notify the DEA. Everybody starts investigating. They can't find this crash DC-6. The injured pilot will die during this time. And they take everybody but to Bogota and hold them in separate cells, interrogate them. They hold them there for a couple of weeks. But eventually, Jimmy will find the right government official. And he pays $10,000 in bribes and gets them all sent back to Santa Marta. And Jimmy's making promises to his contact, Lionel Gomez, that he will make it all up. And once he just got to get out of the country. So they help him and he gets out of the country. Now, the owner of the Air Charter Service had to pay $150,000 to get his pilot, his airplane, and the two paramedics returned. So I imagine Jimmy probably ended up reimbursing him for that, or that guy may have been a secretly a part of this whole operation, was getting a piece of the action. You don't know this narcotics business. The original plan was to disguise Jerry Wilson as the burned pilot and bring him back and just leave the pilot in the hospital. They figured they'd probably take care of him and then come back and get him, but he ends up dying in the hospital. They probably knew he was about dead anyhow. But in the end, they all fly back on a commercial service and keep the air service plane. And that's what they had to pay all that big bribe for. It. And they got it back a couple of years later. Later on, this Jerry Wilson, he was eternally grateful to Jimmy Chagra for flying into action and coming to his rescue. And even at his own peril, because he came down there himself and talked to his contacts, he said he always would take care of his people, which is pretty, pretty important. But some people all say that Jimmy always paid himself first. So there's always like this paint, this different picture of different perceptions of people in this drug business or in any business, actually. To some people, they're heroes and they love them. And other people think they're biggest jerks in the world. It's just people are just people and just business. Not personal, it's just business, as we say. No two ways about it. He and his brother, Lee, were degenerate gamblers, and they had to have a steady supply of cash, and they were willing to take any kind of risk. I mean, any kind of risk. And Las Vegas was where the money was. And as Jimmy Chagra used to parrot Frank Sinatra, well, Las Vegas is the only place I know where money really talks, and it says goodbye. And it was saying goodbye to Jimmy Chagra and Lee Chagra all the time, which made this constant scrabbling and taking a huge risk for money. Jerry Wilson got back in time for his trial in Ardmore, Oklahoma. He tried to keep that Colombian story on the download, but Jimmy was telling everybody about it because one heck of an adventure. I mean, how can you have a big adventure if you don't tell somebody about it? And Jimmy Chagra was that kind of guy. I talked to a prison guard up at Leavenworth, and he said, yeah, he's the kind of guy that always wanted people to like him. One, people think he was cool and always had a lot of stories. So Jimmy was just that kind of guy, a, a real flamboyant personality. The Black Striker, and he was also called the Black Prince. Lee Chagger came to the rescue of the 10 guys in Ardmore, Oklahoma. They said he bedazzled and danced. I don't know if that's the right word, but he, he was a pretty skillful lawyer. And they had local prosecutors. And the evidence was pretty slim and it was really hard to connect everything together and that the marijuana was actually on that plane. The marijuana they discovered, I guess they could get the guys driving the trucks and the pilots to connect them back to the planes. 
Lee Chagra, he had showed up in Ardmore, Oklahoma. It's like a small town in Oklahoma, as we said. He had a Texas-sized black cowboy hat that had the words freedom on the brim and Lee Chagra on the backside of the brim. He wore $1,000 boots. You can buy those $1,000. I can't think of the names. I used to know the names of cowboy boots. You can buy those $1,000 cowboy boots made of ostrich or crocodile or some other kind of exotic snake or some other kind of exotic leather, or exotic skin. I always wore a white suit and carried a gold cane. Now, this guy, he was flamboyant. One of the agents testified they found marijuana seeds and stems inside and under the plane. But he didn't take pictures of it. He didn't collect it. He didn't test it or he didn't put it into evidence. When they asked him why he didn't, he said, well, I don't know. I just shrugged his shoulders. Didn't know why he didn't. I got caught in a deal like that myself one time. It wasn't about drugs. Got a guy's trash and got some chips out of it and just threw it away after we got it. And then we ended up catching him involved in some stuff. And kind of some of the tips came out of that trash. And the lawyer asked me, well, what'd you do with the trash? And I said, we threw it away. <laughs> And then, of course, he starts protesting the judge. I can't let any of this testimony. I never should have had no probable cause. But the judge said, well, obviously they lost the evidence, but I don't think that has anything, one has anything to do with the other. The cops would testify that just before they got to the airport property, they saw somebody offloading something in the U-Haul trucks, but they couldn't tell you what it was. Chagra also got him to admit that there was a hill that really, as you got to the airport, you had to get right onto the airport closer than what they were when the way they described what their viewing position was. And there was a hill that probably prevented them from seeing anything down on the tarmac of the airport. They couldn't see anything unless they're right on that tarmac. So that kind of discredited that testimony, which is easy to do. You say, you know, they're over there doing it. So you just testify. I understand that. I know you would call that perjury, but you know what happened. <laughs> and so you just do it. Every time Lee Chagger discredited a witness, he'd wink at the jury. <laughs> and he was putting on a show and they seemed to like it. He was this flamboyant, attractive, big friendly guy that it was like he and the jury were had this little secret that others didn't know. I mean, that's a good defense lawyer there. Get some of that jury on your side and rest is history if you can do that. I said that after the jury went back to the jury room to deliberate, they were so conflicted. They argued off and on for two days. And finally, they declared they came out and said, we're deadlocked. And the judge declared a mistrial. Two months later, they went back to trial. Prosecution made the same mistakes and a few more. And on the next trial, they even had like a hippie who was a pot smoker and a mother whose daughter had been prosecuted for possession of a small amount of marijuana and another man with real strong, ultra conservative, anti-government feelings. And they get a not guilty on the second one. For Jimmy, he's still smuggling the big loads via freighter like the one in the Folly Cove story. Lee's not doing so well. Uh, he is spending much more money than he can earn as a lawyer. And again, I don't think he was really involved with the marijuana smuggling because he was spending more money than he can handle. He always can make more money and just throw it in and bring those case full, what do they call them, suitcases and even bigger suitcase steamer trunks full of cash money into the cashiers at Caesars Palace or one of the big casinos and just deposit there and let them count it. But there's a new prosecutor in town. There's a new sheriff in town, James Kerr, and he's working for the hanging judge, John Wood. And their whole thing is to put pressure and prosecute these flamboyant El Paso drug smugglers. There's more than just Jimmy Chagra. There's a couple other Pecker Woods that Kim really, he worked with them as much as Chagra and and these two Peckerwood guys work together off and on. By then, it's starting there. The government, there's these new drug kingpin laws. I remember when they came in, it's like you can make somebody rat on their mother when you're talking about 50 years in penitentiary. And these new drug kingpin laws are in with these real draconian sentences and really long sentences, like 25 years and up. That one dude was a young guy, uh, barely out of his teens, Seth Ferrante, used to be on Facebook a lot and done a few different things and in the kind of the true crime genre and, and written some books. He got like 25 years when he was like 21 or 22, and he did about 23 of them, just got out in the last few years. 
and has got into this true crime entertainment business, shall we call it. So my friend, Steve St. John, he got, I think, 14 years for a delighted scheme. And it was just pretty hefty sentences. And there was absolutely no, for Steve and for Seth, and, and even for Jimmy Chagra here, there's no violence. They're, they're not killing off informants. They're not killing opposing competing drug dealers or anything like that. They're not part of a mafia family that maybe, on the other hand, is killing people off and things like that. So these are nonviolent criminals that are supplying the country with what is now legal, marijuana. But the prosecutors are really starting to look at Jimmy Chagra and his brother, Lee, and his younger brother, Joe, who is a drug lawyer. But the prosecutors and the DEA are really starting to look at these guys. DEA is squeezing people with threats of big sentences. They're focusing. You let a lot of people go. If you put your sights on a guy like Jimmy Chagra and his brother, Lee, the whole Chagra family, that's like a hat trick there, man. Three at once, three brothers, that's headlines there. And that's what the government goes for. And in their defense, just like the IRS, you take down one big well-known person and you get a lot of headlines and that'll make a lot of other people stop and think before they get into the business. So it's part of the prevention, but it's also as a cop, I know as your agent or whatever, it's part of your ego to take down the bigger guys too. In the summer of 1977, there's a guy named Wallace, a.k.a. the Fat Man, doing deals with Jimmy. And Jimmy goes to Wallace with another deal. And Wallace has got a big case on him, and he's going to bring down Jimmy Chagra. And Jimmy Chagra, kind of during this time, he's struggling, and he really becomes a glorified mule in other doper operations. One of the guys was Henry Wallace, who was part of the Folly Cove boatload of Colombian weed. Jimmy Chagra is blowing everything and paying a lot more of attention. A lot more of his energy is going into gambling and being kind of a quasi personality and wild and crazy guy in Las Vegas. He lost a big shipment in Ardmore, Oklahoma. He lost another shipment coming out of Columbia and he owes Lionel Gomez a lot of money, especially for the Ardmore shipment. I don't know how that worked out for the Colombians would have got the other one back down there. But these events, he can't seem to get it together. A lot of people are moving on, like the guys that he had in Ardmore and the guys that he had at Folly Cove. They're like moving on because there's like a case being built on them. And he's still got an organization, but he really, his best contacts are now are with not so popular Mexican weed. And he's got to get back to Colombia and this was kind of a marriage made in hell for Jimmy Chagra in the end is going back to Columbia because by now he's got kind of the routes. He knows the smuggling operation. He goes back down to Lionel Gomez, who will front him 50 kilos of now cocaine. And then we're going to use the money from this to then go back into the Colombian marijuana. Chagra didn't really want Gomez to know of his involvement, and he sent Henry Wallace down to Santa Marta and made the deal. And Gomez is like, he smells a rat. He doesn't know what it is, but he doesn't want to do the deal with him. Wallace found another Colombian dude in the cocaine game named Jose Barros, and he said he'd front the cocaine, but he wouldn't give him 50 kilos. But he did get another dealer. This whole thing gets real funky here. Another dealer named Paul Ruiz to front six kilos. But Wallace has got to remain in Columbia as a hostage until they get paid for the six kilos. So you can see here we go from freighter loads of marijuana to down to six kilos. They'll front it, but somebody's got to remain as a hostage. So that things aren't going well in Jimmy Chagra's world. They take off, they send a plane down to Columbia, they get the dope, and on their way north, they have mechanical problems. They have to land in the Bahamas. Jimmy is somewhere around in the area, and he finds he scarfs up another plane. After he scarfs up another plane, they get the coke, and they take that on the six kilos onto the United States. But the coke that they got, they then fronted to other people, and it was those Final users found it was really poor quality, and then they refused to pay for it. Now we got Henry Wallace in Colombia trying to convince Jose Barros, let me do another marijuana deal. I'll get you paid for everything. And things are not going well in the Jimmy Chagra world. Jimmy Chagra is working hard in the United States to make another deal happen. And 
he ends up doing something. But of all things, what I was able to learn is he was at least able to send Wallace's wife and child to Columbia to keep him company. Like, what the hell is that all about? I didn't understand that one. But this is a crazy world we're in here, guys. Now, Wallace, he must be quite a talker because he's convinced Barrios and another Colombian named Riz to front 30,000 pounds of marijuana and get him a ship. And he got an up, upfront payment of $1,000, $100,000, $1,000, what am I thinking of? Jimmy's working on another deal at the same time. He's been flying over the Bahamas and he found that there's a lot of motherships just hanging around out in the area of the Bahamas that are filled with marijuana and they missed their offloading contacts. Somehow the guys that were supposed to meet them and take the cigarette boats and run them into Florida, somehow they didn't connect up. So they're sitting out there and outside he could tell he was up in a plane flying around. He said he knew what the deal was because they were anchored outside a shipping lane just sitting there waiting. So he thought, well, what I'll do is I'll take the marijuana and sell it. And then if I find the real owners, I'll work out where they can get paid. So he goes to one of the ships out there and convinces them to let him start taking the marijuana. Well, these guys are probably glad for anybody to come and get it off their ship. The Coast Guard at the same time is starting to locate these ships. And the magical thing, Jimmy Chagra was a magical character. I said the magical thing is Jimmy Chagra. He's a magical character. He got 24,000 pounds before any Coast Guard started arriving. And actually, when the Coast Guard got there, the captain of that vessel told the Coast Guard, well, this guy, Jimmy Chagra, he came and got a whole bunch of this and ended up agreeing to testify, or at least they had him as a witness. I'm not sure exactly how that worked, but they ended up making a case on Jimmy for this. And they'll end up seizing another 100,000 pounds of marijuana out of this whole operation. I mean, it's just mind-boggling how much dope they were doing down there. So meanwhile, his friend Wallace and his wife and kid, I guess, are still down in Columbia overseeing the loading of another 50,000 pounds of marijuana on a ship called the Donna Petra. And this dope dealer, Colombian Raul Ruiz and Henry Wallace will fly up to Miami and meet Jimmy. He's supposed to give them the money for the missing six kilos of cocaine that they start off with in the cocaine business. He has $40,000 and he promises to get him the rest later in the week because six kilos probably is at least sixty dollars to $80,000 at the time, maybe even a little bit more. I'm not sure. No, it was by the time it got to Kansas City, around twenty five dollars to 30000 a kilo during this time. His other marijuana deal where he's getting the marijuana off the stalled freighters is paying off at the time. And by the end of the week, he's able to pay off Ruiz, send him back. Wallace finds out and he's able to come back from Columbia, but Jimmy's not sharing any of the action here. He's making money all of a sudden and he and Wallace are supposed to be partners and Wallace is mad because he's not sharing the action. And then the Coast Guard at this time, it's got this Donna Petra. I mean, this gets confusing with the 50,000 pounds of marijuana, the Wallace deal that he'd done while he was in Columbia, getting it on up. The Coast Guard intercepted the Donna Petra just outside of Miami and gets a load of Colombian weed. So you just got to write this off, of course, whenever the Coast Guard gets it, the government gets it, you just got to write it off. It's gone, but you got to pay for it. And But Henry Wallace is the guy on the spot because he made the deal with the Colombians. And Jimmy Jagger's already moved along to a new Colombian, a guy named Theodoro is a new source of supply. It's crazy, crazy, crazy. There were several people involved in this deal originally where Wallace went down to Columbia and Wallace gets all of them together and cut Jimmy Chagra out. And they felt like that he was the one that had screwed everything up. Wallace meets with Ruiz and gets him enough money to keep dealing. He starts setting up a New Orleans operation to smuggle marijuana. I mean, do you see why we got so much marijuana, so much dope here in the United States? I mean, it just never ends. Wallace himself was a pretty heavy user, a pretty heavy cocaine user, and he's a bad alcoholic. And he's like down in New Orleans setting up this deal. He's drunk. He's high on cocaine. He's staying in the hotel, the New Orleans Hilton. He has a rental car. He runs in the hotel limo. Then he gets out a whole bunch of cash, tries to buy the limo. 
and they end up calling the cops and they arrest him. They find $114,000 on his person, on Wallace's person. You know, hey, we got something here. This screams big time drug dealer to any cop anywhere. They call the DEA, local New Orleans coppers, call the DEA, and then they come in and start questioning him. And he starts talking about Jimmy Chagger because he's mad at Chagger and then kind of blames Chagger for everything getting bad. Of course, typical alcoholic, drug addict. If something goes bad, it's somebody else's fault. So they start showing interest. And so he agrees to set up Jimmy. As I said before, this is when. He starts making all these people mad, and they're going to set him up. The cops agree. The DEA agrees. They give him back his $114,000. They let this Colombian Raul Ruiz go out of Miami. While it still owes Ruiz over $2 million is what I read, but he knows that he keeps going, and Ruiz knows that he'll be able to pay all that back. But this is kind of the Jimmy Chagra, the things that's going to take him down and give him the case that puts him in front of Maximum John Wood and that prosecutor Kerr are set in motion with Henry Wallace right here in New Orleans. And Jimmy's riding high, wide, and handsome. He's kind of back now. He's got some deals going. He's making money. He's gotten married again to a real beautiful young girl named Liz. They're staying at the Sinatra suite at Caesar's Palace. And supposedly even Sinatra, I think I mentioned this before. I think even Sinatra wanted to stay in a Sinatra suite. And then Jimmy Chagger was in there, so they wouldn't let him. He was taking trunk loads of dope money in. They just weigh it and put it in his account. And Caesar's Palace, I guess, was big in that, washing all that dope money back then. Lee Chagger is kind of one of the more famous narcotics defense lawyers, but they don't know that his gambling's got out of control and the reputation on one hand and what's really going on the other. Sometimes you don't really know. Joe Chagger is practicing law and he's investing in a disco club and kind of they just live in this crazy, wild, high flutin life that they're going to fall from that. The story about the guy, the Greek god that me when a Greek guy, the Greek dude that was in jail and he and his son made his wings from wax and he flew too close. His son flew too close to the sun. The wax melts. The sun melts the wax and that's fly too close to the sun. The sun's going to melt the wax from your wings. You're going to crash. Judge John Wood is giving out draconian prison sentences by this time down there in Texas where they're going to really work hard to get Jimmy Chagra in front and John Wood's district. He even said, here's what, here's a story about John Wood. There's an old man, an old Mexican standing in front of him, and he's like 70 years old. And he, Judge Wood gives him 40 years. And the man says, you know, I don't think I can do that much time. He said, Judge Wood just sarcastically replied, well, try. It's 1977 by now. This is going to be their last good year. So get ready. Episode four, we're going to talk about what happened to Lee Chagra, and it was pretty shocking what happened to Lee Chagra and then the charging of Jimmy under the kingpin law. So thanks a lot, guys. Don't forget, I like to ride motorcycles, so watch out for motorcycles when you're out there. And if you have a problem with PTSD, be sure and go to the VA website if you're a veteran and get that hotline number, and, and there's help available. And if you have a problem with drugs or alcohol, our friend Anthony Ruggiano is – working in a treatment center down in Florida. I could go down there and he can be your sponsor. Or he can be your counselor or whatever. That would be cool, wouldn't it? So if you got a drug and alcohol problem, go down there and see Anthony Ruggiano. There's a hotline number there on my YouTube and or just go to his website or just Google Anthony Ruggiano drug abuse hotline or alcoholism hotline. You'll find him. There's no doubt about it. He's a good guy. I recommend you do that. Don't forget to like and subscribe and give me a review if you're on the podcast app. Tell your friends about it and tell everybody. Repost me on your Facebook pages or on some of the mob organized crime Facebook pages and come back and listen to the next episode and learn what happens to Lee Chagger. It's pretty shocking. Thanks a lot, guys.